Well, it's good to see everyone here tonight. We're in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation, the fourth chapter. We had discussed part of verse 6, and so that's where we'll pick up tonight. Before we begin, let's, as our custom is, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for all the blessings that you've provided to us. We are so grateful for this opportunity in the middle of the week to come together and refocus upon who we are and who we should be in this life. We are thankful for your word where it is so rich with information that even the great and wise can study it for years and years and years, but also the very meek and lowly can figure it out and know what they need to do. And we know that your divine wisdom was behind that, and for only you could make something such possible. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with us as we strive to apply your words in our lives, that we might be the servants you would have us to be. We also pray for our shepherds as they watch over this flock, continue to strengthen them, give them wisdom, be with their lovely wives and all their families. And Father, we also pray that you would be with us as we try to teach your gospel to this lost world, that you would open doors of opportunity for us, that we might spread this gospel. For it is the only good news we truly have in this world. We pray that you would be with us tonight through our time of study. And we ask all this in Christ's holy and perfect name. Amen. Revelation chapter 4. I'm going to make a, a very bold statement here, but one I believe it, it to be very true. This is one of the richest and most powerful scenes in all the Bible. Now, I know that if we were to put up the cross beside this, then yes, the cross would, would be more, more powerful and certainly more meaningful but I say behind the resurrection of Jesus Christ, behind the empty tomb, behind the bloodstained cross, the throne scenes. I, I don't know a more powerful scene than the throne. I want to make a few things very clear, and one of them I have been doing, hopefully, uh, every class. So one thing, this is apocalyptic literature. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. You can't turn open the book of Revelation and start interpreting everything out of it literally or you're going to end up way in left field. This is a specific book with a specific genre to a specific people during a specific time. And hang on, wait for it, wait for it. And for, I think I actually did six, I quit counting. And for a specific reason. Apocalyptic literature. It was written to the Christians of the first century. It is to them, for them, and about them. Now, there are great truths we can pull from it, no doubt. But we've got to remember that. We've got to remember that if we're going to understand this book appropriately and therefore apply it accurately. So that's number one. Number two, I'm going to do a little bit more of a, a, re, a review for this because we we dropped off right in the middle of this scene, okay? So if you'll recall, he has just finished discussing the, the truths to these churches in chapters 2 and in chapter 3. We saw the warrior priest king in chapter 1 and his exalted glory and the way that John describes him is just almost unimaginable. And then now, God is pulling back the veil just a little bit more so that John has revealed further visions that will attest and support the claims that go throughout the rest of the book. So, so this chapter should be very, very comforting to those Christians facing persecution in the first century at the hands of the Roman Empire. And as Suzanne pointed out, and I think quite accurately, we have on display in chapter 4 the exalted throne of God in contrast to the, I like to say, the cheap paper tent the throne of Caesar. And it is no comparison whatsoever to the exalted glory of God in his throne. And, and so we have these two contrasts, okay? In, in this chapter, we're given a glimpse of what's going on behind the scene because that's, that's a lot of what apocalyptic literature is about. It is about the unseen events and the challenge and the struggles 
with the seen things. Because what they're seeing is just, it's horrible, it's unimaginable, it's terrible, it's awful. How can the kingdom of God stand in the present age? Well, John has given a vision, a glimpse of the unseen, the things behind the curtain. Something else I want to correct. I made a, an observation in class on Sunday about the word throne. And I made the comment that the word throne is used 17 times in the book of Revelation. That's not right. It's actually, I miss represented that, it's used 17 times just in this two chapters, 4 and 5, okay? So it's used other times throughout the book of Revelation. It's used 17 times just in chapter 4 and chapter 5. So I just wanted to make that clarification in case somebody was counting words on me here or something and thinking, hey, he lied to me. Well, I didn't mean to. I honestly didn't. So I hope that will kind of give us a little bit of a refresher up to speed now with the throne and the glory and the majesty of God as the one who sits on the throne. So remember just a few things. As John is opened, or the vision is opened to him, the door in heaven in verse 1, he hears the voice as a trumpet saying, come up here and I will show you these things. He sees the one on the throne in verse 2. In verse 3, his appearance is as all of these unimaginable things, the jasper and sardius stone, the rainbow around the throne like an emerald, and then he zooms out a little bit and he sees the, the throne surrounded by 24 thrones with the 24 elders clothed in the white robes with the crowns of gold on their head. And then, verse 5, the lightnings proceeding from the throne, the thunderings and the voices, and the seven lamps before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. In verse 6, here we are, verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Now we made the observation briefly in class on Sunday, but as this scene is unfolding just a little bit more, it really is incredibly awe-inspiring. And it's as if God is, is revealing to John, you thought this was impressive, John. Now look at everything else going on in this scene. And it's just breathtaking. The, the, as this scene unfolds, and I, I'll tell you, I'm not normally this behind on my notes, but I, I just put together my notes on chapter 5. And you, just, you, you, you get done studying, especially these two chapters of God's Word, chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation, and it's just, wow! It, it, it's so hard to soak it all in. And, and folks, that's kind of a trademark of apocalyptic literature. It is... It is incredibly large and graphic details because all he's doing is painting word pictures. He's trying to get us to see the image, pun intended, because <laughs> there's a, a see, uh, that's okay. Now, uh, I want you to notice this. So he says there's the sea of glass like crystal before the throne. So I, I believe for the most part what we're looking at is, is some kind of a separation between creator and creation. And again, he doesn't elaborate, so in all these sections where the apocalyptic writer doesn't necessarily explain explicitly what this symbol is, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful making some assertions because typically, if he doesn't explain it, either the point is not important or the point should be obvious. And I hope that that kind of makes sense. So as we're seeing this throne, we're seeing the image, what we're seeing is the exalted holiness of God and how he does not intermingle with everyone because he is absolutely exalted in his holiness. Now, I hope you'll see this in verse 6. In the midst of the throne and around the throne were the four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. So these four living creatures are distinguished from chapter 5 and verse 11, if you'll flip over there, as he calls these the angels. So look at chapter 5, verse 11. And John said, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now it's subtle, but what you'll see there is there's a distinction being made. These living creatures, to whatever degree, are not in the same category as the angels he talks about here, and nor the elders, and I'll say more on that in just a little bit, so we'll leave that one hanging. One thing that he points out about these beings, though, 
did you notice he says they have eyes? They're full of eyes in front and in back. What do you think that that's pointing out? All seeing. All seeing. Nothing escapes their vision. They are aware of what is going on. They see all these things. Now, we don't know if that, if that really means to some degree they're able to see as much as God. I don't think that that's really the point because, again, God's exalted holiness is what's on display. But all of these beings who are in the courtroom of God around his throne, they all possess incredible powers of some kind. They are incredibly powerful creatures. Now that pretty much wraps up the, last, or the first half of this chapter. So as we've noticed, this is the scene around the throne. The next few verses are the worship around the throne. So does anybody have any questions or comments on the first six verses of chapter 4? Yeah. 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 And what he did. Yeah. 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 That's a great observation. The sea is no longer there when we get towards the end of the book. So we have this time of separation from God and his creation. But through the work of the Lamb, through the work of the Lamb, that sea is done away with. And then they are able to commune with God in His full holiness. Now you'll recall that the theme of the book of Revelation is Jesus wins. And I think that's important. I, I, don't, think that, I don't think it's as accurate to observe that God wins. Now Jesus is God. This is nothing about His deity, okay? But what, it, what I'm saying is, is really the point of Revelation is the exalted Jesus, the Lamb. The Lamb. And so I think it's just a small clarification. I think it's more accurate to say the theme of Revelation is Jesus wins because he is the Lamb. The Lamb who was slain and is counted worthy by God. Yeah, chapter 17 and verse 14. Yeah, that's right. Um, so notice this next few verses here. So as we've observed, this is the scene around the throne. Now, we're going to shift just a little bit to what's happening around the throne, the worship that circles God. Now, we've already read these verses, so we'll just continue on with the verse-by-verse -verse discussion here. Verse 7, And the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now, I know that when you read a verse like that, you immediately start thinking, wow, there's just, wow, I don't even know what to say about that. Well, this is not new, and this is something I've tried to impress upon us, and I think it's important to understand this is not new to apocalyptic literature, and it's not new to the Christians of the first century who were familiar with apocalyptic work. Turn, if you will, to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1. I know you just thought that you were going to avoid Ezekiel class because Russ is teaching that in the back. Well, you thought wrong. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, as we've observed, there are so many similarities in apocalyptic literature. These unimaginable creatures he describes here as living creatures. Ezekiel saw something very similar. Ezekiel chapter 1, so the vision comes to Ezekiel while he's on the river Kebar in, uh, being held captive. So he looks in verse 4, and a whirlwind came out of the north, and it engulfed itself, and brightness was all around it, radiating out of it in the midst like the amber, color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight. The soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. 
The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had a face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. Skip down to verse 18. So in verse 18, he says, As for their rims, they were so high that they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. And then he goes on to further describe the living creatures. Uh, again, the, the scene being described here by the, or through the vision in Ezekiel's time is almost one that it, it's tough to imagine. It, it really is. It is just tough to imagine this scene as it unfolds. And so we're not really told what these creatures are here. We're just told they're, they're called living creatures. Jump over to chapter 10 of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, the 10th chapter. In Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 20, he says, This is the living creature I saw under the God of Israel by the river Kabar, and I knew... They were cherubim, cherubim. Now, you can go back to the book of Revelation for now. We'll, we'll look at Isaiah in a little bit. But, but he recognizes these creatures, these living creatures, as cherubim. Now, it, it's tough to sit there, and I'll have a lot to say on this in just a second, so I won't elaborate on it a whole lot now. But what we do know is these are apparently high-ranking angelic beings, powerful angelic beings. And so these four living creatures in Revelation 4 and verse 7 that are being described are more than likely some type of high-ranking angelic being. It shouldn't surprise us, therefore, to see them around the throne of God. Cherubim, as an example, show up throughout biblical literature. Cherubim are what God placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden to, to no longer allow mankind into that dwelling place. They essentially stand to guard the holy things of God. You guys remember anywhere else where cherubim were used in ancient Israel? Ark of the Covenant. They were the two cherubim on top of the mercy seat, had their wings outstretched over it. If you'll remember Jeff Wilson's discussion on Revelation from back in February, he talked about if you went to the, uh, the veil that separated the most holy place from the rest of the tabernacle or the rest of the temple in later days, the veil had cherubim sewn onto it. Well, they were there as symbolic representatives to guard the holy things of God. So seeing them here in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7, around the throne of God, really shouldn't come as any surprise to us. When you look at just verse 7 in Revelation 4, it is unclear whether the creatures themselves carry this likeness or whether, as Ezekiel describes them, it's more of the face of these creatures. But, but again, something we've tried to elaborate on every chance we get, the point is not the animal. The point is not the animal. The point is the awe-inspiring scene that is unfolding here in the throne room of God as these creatures are being described. The picture. The picture being painted by the apocalyptic artist. So these are special servants of God. To whatever capacity they may be, they are special servants of God. They are strong, swift, intelligent, and always vigilant. And so you can kind of see that in those four creatures that are used to describe this event here. If you'll notice verse 8, as he goes on describing these creatures, he says that the four living creatures, full of eyes around and within, each had six wings, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. These beings with all of the power and majesty that they possess. I want you to see this because I think this is important. With all of the awe-inspiring nature of these creatures, you notice what they do? They turn all their attention back to the throne of God. 
That should impress us. Creatures we can scarcely imagine. Creatures who possess so much raw power and glory and majesty. They still, they still turn their attention back to the throne of God. And they turn towards Him and they do not rest day or night singing praises to God. I think we've got to be careful. I think I've said let's be careful like 84,000 times in this class already. And we're not even halfway through it yet, so you guys just, oof, hang on, buddy. We've got to be careful. Apocalyptic literature is not designed to make every single puzzle piece fit. Okay, typically we're just looking at, at an overall image. It's not about making every single detail fit, and it's not about making Revelation and all the details in Revelation fit with even other apocalyptic literature, because that's not what apocalyptic literature is about. So, I'll give you an example. Isaiah chapter 6. Let, let's look at Isaiah the 6th chapter. This is one of those other scenes of God in His throne. In Isaiah the 6th chapter, how, how could these throne scenes not be some of your favorites, by the way? They are just so awesome. And I think that's just an appropriate word for it. They're awesome. Isaiah the 6th chapter. Let's begin in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Think about this. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Now, now that's another introduction here of some type of high-ranking angelic host, angelic being. Above it, verse 2, stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings... With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And then he cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now it goes on to talk about how the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. And again, uh, the point is exactly how Isaiah responds. Woe is me, I am undone. The vision of God on his throne and the beings around the throne are so incredibly awe-inspiring. That's the point. That's the point. So I I want you to think about this. Isaiah speaks of seraphim in chapter 6. Ezekiel speaks of cherubim in chapter 1, and as we know from chapter 10. What in the world are the creatures here in Revelation? Now here's where the puzzle pieces don't always fit. So I'll briefly mention this. John's work is similar Okay, but it is independent. It is independent. They don't have to be the same creatures, for one thing, but I'll, I'll say more on that. Isaiah's seraphim had six wings. Ezekiel's cherubim had four. John's have six, like Isaiah's. Ezekiel's beings have four faces each. John's have one face each. Isaiah's beings worship before the throne. Ezekiel's go from the throne to carry out divine judgment. John's sing praises before the throne. Fro- <laughs> I don't know, throne. Uh, but he, they sing praises before the throne in chapter 4. Now we'll see them again ushering in the horsemen in chapter 6. We'll see them again giving out the bowls of wrath to the angels in chapter 15. We'll see them once more as they command God's judgment against the harlot in chapter 19. So, what are we to conclude? Are these the same beings as the cherubim? Are they the same beings as the seraphim? Or something other? I've got two options for you. One, these beings are a special order of the heavenly host, being chiefest among them and therefore closest to the throne. Or two, they are a combination an apocalyptic exaggeration using all of the heavenly host that the apocalyptic reader would have been familiar with. Now, truthfully, I think it could be either one and we're just fine. And inside of me thinks it's a little bit of both. We don't have to make all these pieces line up. We don't have to sit here and scratch our heads and say, why, why did they have so many wings on this creature, but then you come to this apocalyptic writer and, 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 and they're different? Well, they don't have to match up. The point is the awe-inspiring impression left by looking at these creatures. That's it. So the 
number of wings, all of that does not have to add up. While the humanity... Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you've got a commonality between all these creatures. Now, again, I think that's the point. The awe-inspiring nature of these creatures and their purpose in serving the glory of God. Okay? That's the point. Now, I hope you'll uh, appreciate this as well. So as these beings are being described, verse 8, halfway through, he says, they do not rest, saying, and then they sing the praise towards the throne. Humanity has to rest. We have to take breaks. We have to sit down. We have to rest and relax. These creatures stay in constant praise and adoration to him who sits on the throne. The praise they give is threefold. And it zeroes in on three different aspects of God's absolute Godness. Those are holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And all three bear out a different detail of God. When, when we see holy, 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 what's the first thought that comes to our mind? The purity. It's great. A lot of times if we're not careful, and, and I, this is... This is typically just because of the language that's used. We see three holies following each other. If we're not careful, we think Trinity. Or we think the Trinitarian aspect of God, that there are three persons of the Godhead. That's not the point here. The point here is, as Howard pointed out, is the absolute, absolute, uncontested holiness of God. Three times he is complete and absolutely holy, supremely different. He is not man. Now, don't you think that would be a comfort by itself when the brethren in the first century are reminded that they are facing Lord Caesar, who's a man? God is holy, holy, holy. Caesar is not. He says the Lord God Almighty. And this speaks of God's, really, His all-knowingness. Almighty occurs like, uh, let me see here, nine, ten times. Ten times in the entire New Testament. Nine of them are in Revelation, and they are all used in reference of God the Father. Now, Almighty, you break it down and it becomes very clear what he's talking about. God is all might. All meaning there is no other. All meaning there is none lacking. He has all might. And so he is the absolute sovereign creator. All power, all rule, all authority, all provider, and you could actually go on for quite a long while in reference to the things that God possesses all of. So he is Lord God Almighty. Do you remember what Caesar requested to be called? Lord Caesar. Essentially the same thing. When they offered the pinch to Caesar, they were to say, Hail Lord Caesar. Here's a subtle reminder. It is Lord God Almighty and no other. And so the third aspect to this praise around the throne is who was and is and is to come. Barclay, in one of his notes, made this comment, and I love it. This speaks of God's everlastingness. Now that's not a word you just, you know, I mean, you don't see that on the menu at Sonic or anything. The everlastingness of God. And that's an awesome word. And it perfectly describes the being who sets on the throne. In, an, in a constantly changing world, here sets the one who is unchanging. Now, does that not impress us? As, I mean, we see how much things have changed in the last 18 months. And yet we serve a God who is totally and completely unchanging, unwavering, unrelenting. He is the leader while emperors... In empires rise and fall. Caesar is nothing. It is Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And this is the being, folks, who the living creatures bow before in total adoration. Uh, Dennis, go ahead.
Yeah. Well, and that's part of the, the beauty and the uniqueness of Jesus. He himself possesses these attributes as well. He is Lord God Almighty. In fact, Jesus is oftentimes called Lord. Lord is the covenantal name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah God. And so, Lord Jesus, that's why we say the Lord. Well, here, here's one of the points where it comes from. Jesus himself is holy, holy, holy. He is the Lord. He is the Almighty. He is who was, is, and is to come. But it, I do want you to notice, at least in Revelation, when the word Almighty is used, it seems to be, it seems to be in reference to the Father specifically. So they are making revelation and the apocalyptic writer is making a distinction as to which being is talking at which time. Uh, again, keep in mind, especially for any of those who came out of a Jewish background, they saw the exalted father not necessarily recognize Jesus on the same level. And that's why so many of the Jews struggled with him. That's why they accused him of blasphemy. It's because Jesus claimed to be the son of God, therefore making him equal with God. That's something the Jews struggled with. Okay? And so I think it's important we see the distinction while also recognizing the uniqueness of our Lord carrying those attributes. Uh, it's a great observation. Anybody have any others? These next couple of verses here, verses 10 and 11, excuse me, verse 9 and 10. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And we'll dig in verse 11 on its own in just a second. In verses 9 and 10, what a scene. These beings who are closest to the throne are still in awe of the one who sits on it. I think that should impress us. You look at the highest angelic order here, the most powerful of the heavenly host, and yet they still turn to offer it to the true and living God. They recognize His true holy nature. Have you ever gotten close to someone... Typically, you'll, you'll hear this of people who've met like a celebrity or something. They're a hero. They loved them. You ever gotten close to someone, and the closer you've gotten to them, the more you've not liked them? Or the more you've realized they're not a good person? <laughs> or the more you've realized that they're a despicable human being and you cannot stand them? That one kind of, that got, that got intense all of a sudden, didn't it? But, I mean, have you ever experienced that? And here's what I think is so fascinating about this thing. Here are these created beings, the living creatures, the cherubim, the seraphim, whatever it is, the high-ranking heavenly host, and as they are so close to God, they see Him in His truest nature. And all they can do is praise Him. It's not as if they are so close to Him that they're like, oh man, he, you know, back here He looked great. But the closer I've gotten to Him, the less holy I think He is, the less powerful I think He is, the less worthy of praise I think He is. <laughs> Not in this case, folks. As close as they are to the throne of God, all they can do is give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne. As this scene unfolds, not only does it affect, I don't know why my voice cut out there, and I went super high pitch, but not only does it affect those closest to the throne, but now you're beginning to see this almost contagious worship. So as the living creatures are giving Him glory and honor and thanks, verse 10, now the 24 elders are falling down before the throne. So you've almost got this ripple effect of worship going on. Living creatures praising, and now the, now the 24 elders, are, they just can't help it. They're, 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 they're throwing in their two cents. They're offering praise before Him who sits on the throne. And, and notice they're taking and throwing down their crowns before His feet. Wow. What a scene, folks. As the being who sits on the throne gave them their victory crowns in the first place, they know exactly who to thank for it. And so they turn and they cast their crowns at His feet. Yeah. The elders prostrated themselves before the throne. They were humble. They were uh, humility. 
Yeah. Yeah. They belong there. Yeah. The elders were now in the presence of the Creator where they weren't before. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great observation. And as you noticed, back up in verse four, the elders are clothed in white and they're given these crowns of gold, these victory crowns. Now keep in mind, and it's hard to think of this in physical spatial terms, but I, I think that in some ways that is a point he's making. You, you've got a situation where you've got God's throne. You've got these four high-ranking angelic beings around the throne, and you've got the 24 elders sitting on their thrones around the throne as well. And all of them turning to the throne of God and praising. Howard, repeat it again real quick. I said there was a, it shows a distinction between the creatures and the elders, where the creatures were worshiping God or the one on the throne in whatever posture they were in. And then the elders prostrated themselves, they, they, they bowed down, they, they, like in humility, there was a, there's a different distinction between those around the, uh, the throne. Those, those that were the creatures yeah. were from the beginning. Yeah. And these people were the, the uh, champ, uh, the, the winners. The they conquerors, the overcomers, yeah, yeah. That's right. You, you, you do have... Now, they're all created beings. All created beings in this scene. Uh, minus the one who sits on the throne. Okay? But, but as these created beings are turning and worshiping the one who sits on the throne, and there is a different level maybe of hierarchy, I think, a little bit is, is kind of Howard's point. You've got those angelic beings closer to the throne versus the elders who are bowing down before the throne. But I think, again, the point, the point is how they are responding to him who sits on the throne. This has been mentioned twice in these two verses, and I want you to see this. We're running short on time here, but in verse 9, they give glory and honor and thanks. Notice this, to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. Verse 10, the 24 elders now respond in worship to him who lives, or him who lives forever and ever. Two different times in two different verses, the emphasis there is on God's, again, His everlastingness. The being who lives forever and ever. Every stage of this throne scene is separating Jehovah God, Yahweh, from the cheap imitations that the Christians are facing in the first century. Lord Caesar, Zeus, Dionysus, all these others, Diana, they're all, they're all cheap imitations. And their thrones are temporal. Their thrones are not eternal as God's is. He is the true and living God. Now, what this does, this whole scene unwraps. In verse 11, we now are introduced to the song that the 24 elders sing. And this has been coined as the song of creation. Look at verse 11 once more. You are worthy, O Lord... To receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. All of these characteristics in this scene, everything happening right now, all the details that have been pointed out, the awe-inspiring beings described, the songs that they offer, it all boils down to the one point. God is in charge. What a comfort that would have been to the brethren in the first century who felt like Rome was in charge, who felt like Caesar was leading the charge against Christianity and that the kingdom of God would surely be stomped out. And here, here sets the record for the whole book, folks. This right here is, is, well, this is one section where typically we talk about this is a different stage of the book because this reminds the reader who's in charge, and therefore all the visions later in the book are as sure as the throne of God in chapters 4 and 5. All the visions about the beast and the beast being destroyed and the sea being removed and the closure that we have as disciples of Christ, all of that stuff later in the book is as sure as God's throne in chapter 4. All of this, again, would remind the, would remind the reader that only the Lord God Almighty is worthy of praise. 
And to bow the knee at any other would be an insult to his absolute holiness as the one who, to, who is worthy, the one to receive glory and honor and power, to worship any other thing, and certainly Rome, would be to insult the true and living God. Uh, one observation very quickly. All creatures, animate and inanimate, that have been created are the product of God's will. Before they were brought into existence as realities, they were planned in the divine mind and were brought forth as expressions of His will. For He commanded and they were created, Psalm 148, verse 5. As one studies any phase of the created universe, he is thinking God's thoughts after him. In writing of the glorious creation, Isaiah asks, Who hath directed the spirit of Jehovah, or being his counselor, hath taught him? Isaiah 40 and verse 13. The self-evident answer is no one. As the creation expresses God's will and is a product of his own plans, so redemption is according to the counsel of his will, his plan formulated before the ages. Therefore... Any form of creature worship is idolatry. I'll, I'll summarize very quickly because I know the second bell already rang. This is a powerful reminder, folks. While the nations rage, while Rome looks in charge and is so fierce in the kingdom of God, how could it possibly stand? John is given a vision of, of God's eternal, powerful, majestic throne. Caesar doesn't stand a chance. I'll encourage you, go read Psalm 2. Because in some ways, I think this scene here is an apocalyptic rendition of Psalm 2. I'm not saying that it is, okay? But go read Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Well, God still reigns. I appreciate your attention. We'll pick up with chapter 5 on Sunday.